is Tristan Johnson, and my research for this presentation is going to be about the American Muslim experience in the wake of the September 11th attacks. So, first to get started, uh, as a threat, as a global conflict, uh, the war on terror uh, defies national boundaries and defies, really, uh, location. So what happens is that as a stateless conflict, it really became this endless, nebulous blob that the U.S. is using to get involved with and make as many things as it feels like it needs to. Um, but as a field of study, the War on Terror has a ton of scholarship. None of it is in history. And as a hopeful historian, this was extremely important uh, to kind of approach with an interdisciplinary mindset. Uh, as uh, someone who's taken American studies, American studies is all about breaking these intellectual silos and introducing different fields to each other. And when talking about historicizing the war on terror, you're gonna, I'm going to have to delve into other areas of social studies, such as social psychology, social uh, uh, sociology, etc. So today I'm going to just go into a little bit of why I'm studying these things, what my research questions are. Uh, then I'm just going to give you guys a rundown of the stuff I've been finding so far. So uh, mostly I've completed my secondary source work, and now I'm diving through the primary source work, and I'm going to dive a little bit of that to show you guys. So first let's start with our introductions. So American Muslims have been in the country since basically the 1600s, or 1700s, sorry. Um, Muslims from Africa had been taken over to the United States as slaves as early as the 18th century and were forcibly converted to Christianity. Uh, then, the 19th century, near the end of the 19th century, mass migration started to begin, especially from the crumbling Ottoman Empire at the time. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was always used in the United States as kind of this example of why you don't over-centralize and why uh, you know, the tyranny of the dictator and all these things. Uh, there was kind of this very Orientalist, very um, dark image of the Ottoman Empire from the United States' perspective. Uh, after the Second World War, a lot of diasporic groups came from the Middle East to the United States and a, sort of to escape political oppression from the new states that were being found in the area. And uh, then there was a huge influx after uh, immigration opened up in the United States in the 1960s. And this group became kind of almost a poster child of the, uh, the model minority, uh, you know, the melting pot story of rags to riches. And while many uh, American Arabs, Muslims, North Africans felt that they had made it, they still were, I would probably say, integrated rather than assimilated. They had, lot, they had not gained their American uh, integration at, say, Earlier uh, melting pot groups such as like Italian Americans, Irish Americans had um, had earlier, but as a whole, it was an extremely uh, conservative block. Uh, the 2000 election showed an 80 percent turnout for uh, Republican uh, voters in the Muslim American bloc, and that part of George Bush's victory in 2000 would be due to that. And uh, as of today, there is about 2.4 million American Muslims. So let's just go into the secondary sources that I've been starting to dive through. Uh, mostly because of the, the structures in American studies, this heavily relies on things like critical theory, philosophy, political philosophy, and such. But um, the war on terror has uh, led to over a thousand bias incidences in just 2002 alone, a 50% increase in hate crimes. Uh, as of 2012, these assaults do continue, uh, and still vigilante violence is common. Airline passenger paranoia has increased and stayed high since September 11th. And both Arabs and Arab-looking Americans have been removed from aircraft. And this includes South Americans, Filipinos, anybody who looks too brown to fly, essentially. Um, the new term is flying while brown is the new driving while black. Uh, so. This is not just a private, you know, um, bad people uh, being cruel and unjust to citizens. It has a public support. Specifically, there were mass arrests after 9-11 of over 700 uh, immigrants. And 
many of them were held and uh, treated as September 11th uh, suspects, despite the fact that they were mostly just being held because they were INS, um, they were basically in violation of immigration law. Yet they were still kept under 24 hour um, solitary confinement. They were kept in handcuffs, leg chains, heavy braces, and uh, denied uh, more than a one phone call a week to their lawyers and such like that. Um, there's also a coercive, yeah, sorry. Um, in LA, over 400 nationals were strip searched, verbally accosted, deprived of food and water, bedding, adequate clothing, and denied info about why they were detained. The legality of their arrests were overwritten, and even afterwards, the Department of Justice admitted that they passed far too wide a net. Uh, Brooklyn, 84 detainees were physically and verbally assaulted. Under harsh detention policies, as I said, they were handcuffed, legged irons, 23-hour lockdown, and given one call a week. Uh, the IIRA, which is the, um, sorry, um, oh yes, the IRA is the Immigration Restriction Act that was passed. Uh, there's also the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, as well as the, of course, infamous USA Patriot Act, all of which allowed to enable further uh, policing, uh, detain detaining, and really just uh, cruel treatment of Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, and anybody who is perceived as such. So when trying to describe what's going on here, there's been a, um, a realm of political philosophy that's been really popular since the 1970s. Sorry about this nice guy, Michel Foucault here. Talking about biopolitics, which is that in the, uh, in the land of uh, the time we're not talking about geopolitics, where you know the politics over who owns land and territory, now the political realm has expanded to control and domination over the bodies of its subjects. It also establishes this sort of body-state metaphor where systems in the state can also be considered uh, system, like, compared to systems within the human bodies. And this leads to an interesting contradiction, specifically when referring to, to the war in Afghanistan, you had instances where Americans were dropping bombs on areas and then dropping food aid at the exact same time. And it's an extremely contradictory uh, essentially killing for the sake of saving lives. And this is where uh, Italian philosopher Roberto Esposito comes in and discusses this topic called immunity, which is that, like with the state body metaphor, there's something called immunity where agents of coercion introduce aspects of death and destruction in order to preserve the overall health of society. It's a problematic and very disturbing metaphor, but uh, it leads to this kind of immune response and tries to explain why the state is acting the way it is. Uh, then, when you have something called autoimmunity, now autoimmune disorders in biology are when your immune system attacks yourself. It takes parts of the own body and turns it into, a, or identifies it as an enemy marker. And that uh, Esposito wrote that this is the kind of downward slope towards totalitarianism is when the state starts to attack aspects of its own body and create a uh, harsh state. Um, of course, biopolitics was kind of part of the uh, theoretical analysis behind what caused uh, Nazis and like fascism, and so it's kind of uh, always trying to explain why do totalitarian states form. Uh, so the other part is another famous uh, cultural philosopher named Stuart Hall, and he wrote about something called the moral panic, which is that when a uh, large societal problem starts to arise, there's an overreaction that leads to not only uh, stigmatization of certain groups, but the state will also heavy-handedly uh, respond with, say, like a war, uh, the example he used from the British mugging epidemic of the 1970s, and there'd be like a war on muggers or uh, Attempt. But what happened was is that it would eventually overreach to the point where and to the point where it'd be overbearing, and it would be used to target specific minorities. In the case of the mugging, it was used to target black youth in, in Britain. So, so the next part is racialization. 
So when I was talking about Arabs or quote Arab looking or Muslim looking Americans is because there's been this conflated uh, pan-Muslim identity that's been built in the United States' as, uh, global, uh, psyche since, uh, well, before September 11th, but uh, definitely exacerbated and cemented afterwards. Americans didn't take the opportunity to, exam to examine their legacy of colonialism or their global adventures or other factors around terrorism and instead decided to look at things through their familiar lenses of religion and race. So racialization is when differences and color lines and relationships are established via uh, relationships between racial groups. Uh, this is kind of, uh, when you talk about race as a social construct, this is how the social construct is constructed, with the inequality and attributes attached to such. So in the wake of September 11th, Muslims, Arabs, and those who were quote-unquote Arab-looking were falsely attributed these ideas of danger and criminal acts of criminal, yeah, this, this, this photo pretty much shows. <sighs> but this has a long history. Uh, the anti-Muslim sentiment actually ranges back to the Iranian Revolution. Already we're seeing non-Arabs being conflated with Arabs. Uh, the hostage crisis and Middle Eastern violence in general. They were uh, reduced to a single group that would remove ethnicity, religion, and race. And uh, this would lead to hate crimes that would be expanded to those against Middle Eastern descent, regardless of religion, and those who are of North African, South Asian, Turkish descent as well. So uh, this would also be expanded to, say, like uh, Pakistanis, uh, Indians, whether they were Muslim or not, and uh, as I'll go into a little bit, uh, really heavily targeted at Sikh Americans. So the stereotype established about this global, this nebulous uh, Muslim identity is that of the irrational and violent man and the oppressed woman. Uh, fanatical, misogynistic, anti-American. And uh, women are put in the place of public sympathy or moral outrage. Okay. Muslims also were given the title of the terrorist which uh, this meant that vulner uh, made vulnerable many huge uh, Middle Eastern uh, communities in the United States, and over 300 Muslim organizations were attached as unindicted co-conspirators co in a Texas terrorism case. So they're casting wide blankets, and really, whenever uh, terrorism cases arise in the United States, the entire Muslim community of the region gets amalgamated in. As I said, over 300 Muslim groups were uh, indicted in a Texas case. And um, there's other, there's been, uh, the National Association of Muslim Lawyers reported that there's been a systematic demonization of all things Muslim since 9-11. Uh, there was actually a 2012 billboard ad of the World Trade Center with Quranic verses overlaid on top. They, uh, when talking about why the, you know, the, the quintessential question, why do they hate us? They defaulted back to philosophers such as, well, philosophers such as Samuel Huntington, saying that they, they hate us because of our constitutionalism, our legalism, our dedication to freedom and democracy. Uh, this was used, um, it was defined as a civilizational rather than ideological uh, debate. Um, writers like Jean Elst Elstein wrote that, they hate us because of our commitment to freedom. And it also leads to media depictions. Uh, because of how social racialization works, when there is limited discussion between different ethnicities, media representation really plays a large part in forming these traits that are attributed. Uh, you had generally unfavorable media representation. There's a long history going from Orientalist 1920s you know, uh, the Sheik of Baghdad and things like that to more modern stereotypes of angry, violent Arabs. Uh, examples that you would see would be like um, in Oklahoma City, after the Oklahoma City bombing, until the perpetrator was unearthed, it was assumed to be an Arab terrorist. Uh, the Muslim Council of Britain has said there's been endless pictures emanating from Iraq of Iraqi tortures, brutalization, and degradation look at like the coverage of Abu Ghraib and uh, other just terrible um, images. 
the, uh, the Sanare brothers at the Boston bombings that happened roughly a little over a year ago uh, had their images Arabized and darkened for the cover of, I believe it was The Week magazine? Yes. And uh, sympathetic portrayals do exist. There was television coverage showing Arabs as unfairly targeted by uh, prejudice. But they were put aside dramas such as shows like 24, Sleeper Cell, NCIS, JAG, The Grid, Agency, LAX, Threat Matrix. All these shows really portraying unfavorable and dangerous stereotypes. Funny enough, a lot of these shows will hire uh, Latin American, Greek, or South Asian actors to portray Arabs, further adding to that like nebulous um, brown equals terrorist idea. And then racial profiling, where you pinpoint uh, certain racial groups as threats, was rampant. Um, Muslim Americans have claimed profilings, especially on mass transit. Violations of rights links to changes in their organizational priorities. A lot of these organizational priorities of security after 9-11 have increased it. Uh, some defended it, like New York Times columnist uh, Nicholas Kristall claimed that racial profiling made Israel a place that was safe to fly. Uh, and Human Rights Watch has reported on growing use of profiling on nationality, religion, and gender. All right, and positives. Uh, there was a man who was arrested in Brooklyn because he was going around simply killing Middle Eastern shopkeepers, regardless of their religion. They, they've been removed from flights. They have received hate mail, assaulted, property damage on mosques and homes. And uh, community centers were either vandalized or set on fire. Muslim communities started to, uh, needing escorts to protect people, trying to get to and from their homes. They officially feel like second-class citizens. Uh, there's been 645 bias incidences in crimes aimed at South Asians and Middle Easterners at just uh, in 2012 alone. And the Muslim community had to react. Depression, sadness, shock, fear, uh, self-censorship in public, uh, more shaving, less wearing of religious garb, avoiding of religious and ethnic markers, um, a feeling of being excluded from the 9-11 grieving process, a uh, feeling of association with the enemy, and uh, even reduced mosque attendance are all impacts of this, uh, this, this thing. Many Middle Eastern men and their families actually fled the United States, moving primarily to Canada. Uh, many Pakistani Americans voluntarily returned to Pakistan. And um, really the, the, the only positive response we could find was that many would start to begin wearing the hijab as kind of an identity of um, solidarity with fellow Muslim Americans. So this also ties into major themes within American history, specifically the melting pot. These people have been, uh, who felt like they were integrated, who felt like they had lived the American dream, found themselves in a very fast time ejected, feeling that they were made into a threat in a very quick and dramatic way. And also, the return of nativism. Now, in American history, nativism is a theme that shows up over and over again. Whenever there is a shock to the American system, with something such as 9-11, there is a attempt to identify the group that caused it and then conflate everybody with it and then say that the reason this happened is because we didn't throw them all out or whenever these uh, emergencies come up they always say we need to work about immigration. And at the time of 9-11 there had already been a decade of moral panic created over illegal immigration from Mexico that had led to increased hate crimes at, uh, attributed to Latin Americans, but 9-11 exacerbated this immensely. And it did lead to some restrictions on immigration into the United States. And uh, large deportations became very common in the years following the September 11th attacks. So that's what I have for my secondary research. That's my basis for going forward. Now, I'm in this phase where I'm doing primary source work. So primarily, I've gone through uh, some reports that were sent to me by Pew, which is a group that 
they interview people in the United States over the phone, they just get their opinions on different things, and they've had a few reports they did on attitudes towards Muslims. So here you can see that uh, compared from 2005 to 2010, there's actually been a decrease in favorable attitudes towards Muslims, and that um, really it's just, uh, it's actually been going downhill. This is, uh, this 2010 report was done around the time of the 9-11 mosque a fiasco where attitudes really took a shock. And if you look at a democratic breakdown, it's extremely linked to age, education, and political affiliation. As you can see, unfavorable attitudes towards Muslims are very highly concentrated on the Republican wing of their political spectrum, um, in lower than college graduate education, and as you get older, opinions just start to drop. So compared with other religions, this is a question they asked whether they felt that Islam was more or less, more violent or as violent as any other religion that it encourages or not. And really, this is nonpartisan and they usually air against it. So that is at least a little bit of a saving grace there. Um, and this is a poll where they polled Americans asking whether or not with public support you should be able to block the building of Islamic centers or mosques. And generally, they disfavor it. But when talking about the 9-11 mosque, they overwhelmingly turned against it. As you can see, 51% of Americans disapproved of the 9-11 mosque. But then, as you see, um, it's again linked to age, education, and um, party representation. <laughs> Now, uh, this is another interesting slide here where you talk about how much Americans feel they know about Islam. Many claim to be in this, uh, this zone here, they don't know very much of Islam. But you notice that over time, it's actually increasing on the end where the people feel like they have a greater idea of what Islam is while relations are getting worse. Which means that they're becoming more certain about these misrepresented ideas. And Yet, Americans feel that Muslims are one of the most discriminated groups in the United States, second only to uh, gays and lesbians. And uh, yet, Muslims are also portrayed as the most, uh, this is a poll where they ask people whether or not uh, these religions are significantly uh, similar or different to your own. And uh, as you can see here, Muslims top the charts at being the most perceived as different. And here, we have, uh, this is just a people where we talk about U.S. Muslims. So American Muslims are actually quite a unique community amongst the global uh, Muslim community. As you can see, uh, this is the global median, this is the U.S. median. Uh, as for most uh, people who have most or all of their friends as Muslims, 95% is the global median, but 50% is the, uh, the U.S. Religion being important is much lower. They pray less than once a day or once a day or more, is much less in the United States. Mosque attendance is way lower. Um, and also just pluralistic ideas of interpretations of the Quran are also much more popular in the United States. 57% as opposed to 21 is a global median. And um, those who feel that there are only one interpretation is extremely low in the United States. So it's an extremely uh, different community from uh, the global average. So here I have Another primary source that we have this is the Glenn Fine report. As I mentioned, this guy was the um, Inspector General uh, working for the Department of Justice. He's the one who investigated the mass detonations that, that detains, detainments that happened in the wake of September 11th. And he basically said that uh, the New York, like uh, he had four, uh, sorry, five major issues uh, that the detainees were not classified properly. So. Those who were, as I said, those who were violating immigration law were lumped in with suspects of being involved in September 11th attacks. Uh, they were not notified of charges in a timely manner to get ready to uh, prepare for incarceration. Uh, the clearance process, uh, after people were cleared of their charges, it would take sometimes days to weeks to be released. It was an extremely slow and arduous manner. And as I mentioned earlier as well, the conditions of detainment were terrible. Communications blacked out, restrained information, restricted telephone access, um, incarcer uh, heavy incarceration, 
and 20, uh, the other one was 24 hour lighting. The other one I've been investigating is Human Rights Watch, which is a group that really tries to make reports on global human rights issues around the world. As of 22, they report that there is still profiling going on in the United States, even uh, with the support of John Brennan, who is Obama's chief counterterrorism advisor. Uh, one example would be an undercover police officer who actually investigated a Muslim group going on a rafting trip. And student organizations all around the United States have been wrapped up in this. So now for my next steps. I'm going to start building very soon my own database of discrimination events to see if I can make my own statistics. These are going to be my section on going over what's been done already, but this is going to be my own. And so I'm going to be primarily going through databases of newspapers and incident reports. I'm also going to see if I can find anything in congressional records to build up my database of work. And I'm still waiting to hear from Amnesty International. I have contacted them and their researchers getting back to me very soon. And Human Rights Watch still has a few more reports to go through. And of course, I still have to go through uh, files that are put by the FBI and the ACLU. So to conclude, what I'm doing here, or attempting to do here, is problematizing the entire popular notion of the American melting pot. That the pot is reversible, and that Muslims were subjected to a period of deintegration, and that they were targeted on racial grounds. Thank you guys very much.